Hello, today's Bible study is going to be on the cloud or the clouds. Now, the first time that a word or phrase is ever mentioned in the Bible, at least in the King James Bible, the modern versions don't do this, but the first time something's mentioned in the Bible, it's usually explained either in the within the verse or the preceding verse or the verse after so the first time that the word cloud is mentioned it has reference to the flood of Noah if you turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 9 and let's see let's go to verse 8 and God spake unto Noah now we're talking about Noah and the flood and to his sons with him saying and I behold I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and we're talking about you know children seed verse 10 and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the feet, or earth with you, from all that go out of the ark, to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. So, this is the first time in the history of the world up to this point that there had ever been a flood, worldwide flood, and the Lord said he was going to make a covenant, an agreement, a contract, that the world wouldn't be destroyed in another flood. Uh, the next time is going to be fire. Matter of fact, we should look that up. But yeah, we'll look it up. Let me get this done first. Verse 12. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between you, me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Perpetual means pretty much forever. Verse 13. I do set my bow in the cloud. Uh, it's talking about a rainbow. Isn't a rain isn't a rainbow curved and a bow, an arch you know, an archery, a bow is curved. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth and God said unto Noah this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So God made an everlasting covenant with Noah and his children that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And there are some people that say the flood was localized. It was just in the Middle East. But you know what? If that's true, then God's a liar here because he said he wouldn't bring any more floods. Well, Tell that to the people in uh, uh, Japan, you know, when the Fukushima thing happened. They had a flood, right? They have, there's, there's floods all over the place. So this has to be talking about a worldwide flood. All right, so next time the world's going to be destroyed, not with water, but with fire. Oh, a point I should point out. 
the wicked were baptized, so to speak, in a flood. This flood. Okay? So, let's take a look. All right, turn to 2 Peter 3.12. And, uh, well, let's go to verse 37, uh, 2 Peter 3.7. Uh, there's actually people that uh, will tell you that 2 Peter doesn't belong in the Bible, it's a fake, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, tell them to go to hell, because they probably are. Because the Bible warns that people that would remove God's words out of the his Bible, out of his book, would have their names removed, blotted out from the book of life. I don't want to read that, but, uh, you know, basically, I, I, I honestly believe that, that people that rail against Oh, these, this doesn't belong in the Bible. I think these people do. I think they actually delete their names, if their names were even written in the Book of Life to begin with. I don't know. Okay, Second Peter 3, 7. But there's a lot of people that don't like uh, the book of Second Peter because it confirms Paul as a brother in Christ. And then they hate Paul's writings, so... All right, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Peter 3.12 Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So, the earth was destroyed the first time, uh, the wicked, by the flood. The second time, the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. So, I always found that interesting. Alright, uh, go to First Peter 3.20 which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved. Eight souls were saved by water. See, the earth baptized, technically, I guess you could say, the wicked. Noah was saved by the water. And in 2 Peter 2, 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. One thing I always found interesting was the, uh, the homosexual sodomite community well, the whatever, lesbians, bisexuals, whatever, uh, what is it, LBGT or whatever, transgenders, whatever that is. Uh, their community has always adopted the rainbow as their symbol. I always thought that was interesting that, um, you know, <laughs> here it is, uh, the wicked were destroyed by the flood and the rainbow was God's symbol to Noah and his children that he wouldn't destroy the world the wicked the wicked world in the with the flood again and here it is uh, the wicked adopt the rainbow as their symbol so what can I tell you now if you turn to Exodus 13 21 uh, the next time that the word cloud appears. Now, Exodus is when the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, which had grown into quite a number of people, by the way, 
they were enslaved in Egypt. And then they had the, you know, the first Passover. And then, this is after, um, and then after they, when they went into the wilderness for the 40 years, if you turn to Exodus 30, 13, I'm sorry, Exodus 13, in verse 21, we read, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So here it is. The cloud was a symbol of the covenant of God not to destroy the earth again with a flood. The next time a cloud's mentioned, the Lord is leading the children of Israel through the desert in the wilderness, by day with a pillar of a cloud, and then at night a pillar of fire. Okay? All right, so turn to Exodus 14, 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these so that one came not near the other all the night. So evidently, Uh, the cloud was darkness to the Egyptians, but to Israel, it was light. You know, didn't Jesus say in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, that's what the symbolism is, people. God's leading his people out of Egypt with um, the light by night. Uh, let's see. And then verse 24. Exodus 14, 24. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Now I don't know how many of you know history, but Egypt had all kinds of heathen satanic practices. Matter of fact, they've even got a thing called the Book of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And uh, I'm sure it was authored by Satan if you go back far enough. So they had multiple gods. Um, some really really weird stuff there you know the Lord the Lord doesn't say very many nice things about Egypt you know usually when the Lord talks about Egypt it's it's not a good thing so all right so let's keep going all right Exodus 19 9 and the Lord said unto Moses lo I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may know when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. All right, let's go to verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding, exceedingly loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Let's see, so Moses was up on the mount on the third day, huh? Uh, 
wasn't didn't Jesus spend three days and three nights in the grave? Ah, oh, so let's see. All right, turn to Exodus twenty four sixteen. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. Wasn't the flood of Noah for forty days and forty nights? When uh, Jesus started his ministry, didn't he go forty days and forty nights in the desert? Um, that 40, 40 days and forty nights, that, that pops up a few times in Scripture. So, all right, let's continue with the clouds. All right, turn to Exodus 34, 5. And matter of fact, let's go back to Exodus 34, 1. This whole chapter is worthy of being read. It's... All right, and the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets, tables of stone, like unto the first. And I will write upon these tablets the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. I don't know if you know the story or not, but uh, Moses was coming down from the mountain with uh, the Ten Commandments and saw Aaron and the people dancing with the golden calf, so uh, he threw down the tablets, the tables of stone with the Ten Commandments on them. So, um, I've heard it said that nobody Nobody broke the Ten Commandments like Moses did. Uh, verse 2. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud. And the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So, you know, there, um, according to this verse here, people that are into witchcraft are cursing not only their children, but their children's children and their children's children's children to the third and fourth generation. Serious stuff, people. Verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I will make a covenant for all thy people. I will do marvels such as not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, 
for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite, the Hittite and the Perizzite, and the Hivite and the Jebusite. And for those of you that don't know it, um, these tribes of the Canaanites, uh, they're tied in. If you look at the family trees with the giants, uh, the Philistines are among the Canaanite tribes. And then compare that with Genesis 6. You'll know why the Lord said to drive these people out. Why not to get married with them? But that's another entire subject altogether. Verse 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. A snare is a trap. It's not a drum set. Okay? Um, and that's what a snare is. It's a trap. It's a trap of Satan. Verse 13. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. See, witches like to, um, and Satanists like to go out into the groves and do their little Satan worship. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after other gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. In other words, don't take the daughters of the Canaanites and let them marry your sons. And likewise, don't let the Canaanite men marry your daughters. And this is exactly what happened to Solomon. Now, I don't know many of you know it, but um, in Leviticus 16 and verse 2, Aaron was the uh, first Levitical priest. He was of the tribe of Levi. As was Moses, because they were brothers. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So here it is, they built the tabernacle, and the Lord appeared in a cloud upon the mercy seat. Now that mercy seat is a type of Christ in the future. A lot of people don't catch that. Um, some people have done some really excellent research on uh, the tabernacle and the different meanings of the furniture that was in it. And um, so... What can I tell you? Verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. Numbers 9.22. And whether it were two days or a month, or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journey not, but when it was taken up, they journeyed. In other words, there was a cloud. And if the cloud stayed there, the children of Israel stayed there, and if the cloud moved, the people went with it. Okay? And the uh, so when the cloud moved, the people followed the cloud. All right, uh, turn to Numbers 11.25. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took the, of the Spirit 
that was upon him and gave it upon unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Now these seventy elders, um, this is where the Jews claim, this is where the Sanhedrin started. Okay? But the if you want to call this the San, beginning of the Sanhedrin, that's fine, but the Spirit of the Lord was upon them. Um, in Jesus' day, they were just, you know, the Spirit of the Lord wasn't upon them, so what can I tell you? All right, uh, let's see, and, um, ah, Numbers 1642. Let's go there real quick. Uh, let me give you a little background. The, um, there were those that rebelled against the Lord and basically were rebelling against Moses and Aaron. You know, when the Lord pick somebody to lead the people and you go against that person you're technically going against the Lord so okay number 1642 and it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the living and the dead, and the plague was stayed. And they that died in the plague were 14,000 and... 700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah and Korah was the uh, ringleader of the rebellion and Aaron returned unto Moses and unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the plague was stayed you know it's serious business to rebel against the Lord I mean you know people think it's no big deal it, uh, it's a big deal, people. Now, in 1 Kings 8.10, we read, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the tabernacle, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. You know, in the days of Solomon, in uh, 2 Chronicles 5.13, we read, It came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, that when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand and minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. So here it is even in uh, when Solomon had built the first temple, the cloud appeared again. Now here's an interesting verse, Isaiah 19.1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt. 
and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Now remember the tabernacle, um, they, they had the, the cloud that filled the, the glory of the Lord. In Isaiah 44, 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. So, the cloud is kind of like the goodness and the glory of the Lord concealed. I mean, you can see the cloud, but you can't see what's in the cloud. Because with these flesh bodies, we cannot endure to see the glory of the Lord. Here's a verse for the end times. Ezekiel 32, 7. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. I will also vex the hearts of many people when I shall bring thy destruction among the nations into the countries which thou hast not known. You see, in Revelation, I believe it's Revelation 24, the Bible talks about the sun and the moon not giving up her light at the end time. Just before, well, right at the end. So, here's a reference to that. The book of Hosea is really a sad book. It's the Lord pleading with his children Israel to return to him as a wife beloved of her husband that ran off to be with another. In Hosea 6.4, the Lord says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the dew, and as the early dew, it goeth away. You ever wake up first thing in the morning, just before the sun comes up, and then as the sun's starting to come up, you can see the dew on the, the bushes and the grass and the trees. And then as the sun gets up and it gets hot, all the dew is gone. Well, that's what the Lord is saying here. Your goodness is as a morning cloud and as the early dew. And then as the sun comes up, all the goodness goes away. All right. Turn to Matthew 17, 5. When Jesus comes to earth, uh, came to earth in a, in a human form, we read the following. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This is Jesus with the disciples. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So clouds figure into the Lord's doings here. Mark 9 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. If you turn your Bibles to Luke 21, uh, basically in Luke 21, 7, it says, And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? 
If you look this up uh, in Matthew 24, they're basically asking him, what's going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? All right, so um, I don't want to read the whole thing, but um, let's see. All right, go to verse 17. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Isn't that even true today? Christians are becoming a, a hated bunch. But there shall not an hair of your hair head perish. In your patience possess, possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. You know, I just thought of something, and it's not really part of this study. Um, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now, I wonder... If Jerusalem's going to be uh, surrounded by armies just before the Antichrist uh, sets himself up and says, you know, he is God, or if this is only talking about just before Jesus comes back. And there's a lot of people, uh, the modern church world says that uh, when the world, when the when the world's armies come against Jerusalem, that Jesus is coming back to save them. Uh, but then there's the other flip side of the coin, that at the end, when Jerusalem's surrounded by armies, when Jesus comes back, isn't the world gathering together to fight Jesus Christ and his army? You know, that's that's how I see it. Now, I'm not saying I'm right, but that's how I see it. That the world, uh, the, all the armies of the world come to Jerusalem to fight Christ when he returns. But then the modern church world, the Zionists, all say, well, you know, that Jesus is coming back to save Jerusalem. I don't know. I don't see it like that. So... All right, well, verse 20, just something to think about, people. You know, I, I'm not saying I'm right. but All right, verse 20, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them that are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein, therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distresses of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's heart, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Listen carefully. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And then, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption. 
draweth nigh. Oh, Jesus has got it all wrong. Doesn't he know there's a pre-trib rapture that happens before this? Oh, never mind. Um, no, Jesus doesn't have it wrong. The pre-trib rapture people have it wrong. You know? This is when your redemption happens. And of course, the pre-trib people will tell you, well, this is written for the Jews, and we're the church, and the church is out of here, and this is for the Jews. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's see what else we got. I should uh, cover this just a little bit more. In the book of Joel, uh, turn to Joel 3, and uh, I guess we'll go to 3.15. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And what's that decision? Who are you going to follow? The Lord? Are you going to follow the Lord or are you going to follow Satan? Verse 15. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. This is talking about the end, people. Verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Um, and so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. See, right now, Jerusalem is anything but holy. All right, Matthew 24. Let's go to... Um, Verse 29, immediately after, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give off her light and the stars and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then, I'm sorry, and he shall send his angels with a great voice, I'm sorry, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So obviously, this is talking about the end. Um... If you go to Revelation 18, I'm sorry, Revelation 8, 12. Okay, this is definitely talking about the end. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so that the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and not li night likewise. All right, so let's see what else we got about the clouds. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, this is Paul. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ but with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness Didn't God kill with the plague? Of 
Korra and those with Korra. So, our fathers were under the cloud, and we passed through the Red Sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Tell that to the Catholics. You know, they say, oh, the rock was Peter. Uh, you know, I like Peter. Peter's probably my favorite apostle. But, sorry, Peter's not the rock. The Bible says the rock was Christ. And if the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't care what the Pope says. Uh, Pope has no meaning for me. All right, turn to Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in heaven, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the fourth firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, a saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I say, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Why am I thinking of Obama and uh, uh, this immigration deal when I think about turning to flight the armies of the aliens. Never mind. Verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Think of Kent Hovind. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore seeing, oh, chapter 12, 1. Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
You see, when we're caught up to be with the Lord, that's going to be the cloud of witnesses. All those that were mentioned in the Old Testament and all those that believed in the New. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. I almost missed this. This is an important thing. Uh, okay, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, you know, they're talking to Jesus here. They asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time, times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Listen carefully. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. In other words, he went up into the clouds. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So the same way that he went up to heaven in a cloud, he's going to return in the same manner. And you could take that to the bank. Well, the bank won't accept it, but uh, that's okay. All right, Revelation 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, the sun. And his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And of course, John was going to write what the seven thunders said, but he was told not to. So I just thought I would, uh, you know, uh, point that out. All right. Let's go to Revelation um, 11. Now this is talking about the two witnesses. Okay, that uh, the two witnesses that um, testify against the false prophet. Uh, let's start in verse 7. Verse 6. These two witnesses, right? These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them the blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And people, this is so very similar to what happened in the days of Moses when the plagues of Egypt. I mean, this is going to be very, very similar. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. The Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. 
So Jerusalem is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And uh, just so you know it, from what I understand, Jerusalem just had its uh, 12th gay pride parade. So spiritually being called Sodom, yeah. Verse 9. And, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them, which they saw. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Personally, I think this is when some of the Jews are going to actually repent and come to Christ. This is my opinion. So, all right, let's continue. All right, uh, turn to Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Boy, you read that to people and they'll... They accuse you of lordship salvation and being a heretic and um, trying to earn your salvation and work salvation. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Personally, I think people that accuse you of work salvation and lordship salvation, they live in wickedness. And they want you to live in wickedness, too, so that um, maybe, maybe they want to have company when they go to hell. I don't know. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Huh, their works follow them. And I looked and beheld a white cloud. And I looked and beheld a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And uh, this is the end, people. This is the end. And another angel came out of the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the wine, the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath, the wrath of God. 
and the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Very symbolic, people. When it's talking about the clusters of grapes, it's talking about the people. Doesn't the uh, Bible talk about the earth being the Lord's vineyard? If you uh, care to read, you can read uh, Matthew, Matthew 21, where it talks about uh, the vineyard. All right, let me prove to you the vineyard is... Uh, turn to Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Oh, boy. I wasn't planning on doing this, but uh, here we go. Jeremiah 12, 10. Think about TBN Network, uh, the Beelzebub Network. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Wow. Um, Matthew 21, verse 1, 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Isn't that what Christians are supposed to do? Be laborers for the Lord in his vineyard? So, all right, well, I think I made the point. The uh, That's going to be the harvest and the grapes the grapes are going to be, in the, in the Lord's harvest, the grapes are going to be the people in that verse that I read in Revelation. And the harvest is the end of the world. If you want another uh, witness, turn to Matthew 13, verse 37. The parable of the wheat and the tares. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares, or the weeds, are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and bundled in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So I think that pretty much proves that point. Um, I was going to close out right here, but I thought I should mention this too. Turn to Isaiah 14. Verse 12, the modern Bibles, uh, especially the NIV, hide this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. See, Satan aspired to be the 
in the heights of the clouds, just like the Lord. Sorry, job's been taken. Uh, that position's been filled. So, turn to Zephaniah 1.15. It's in the Minor Prophets. Those are that, those books, those real short books that are just before the New Testament. This concerns also when the uh, Lord returns. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastedness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Here's a, a couple of interesting verses. This is generally the uh, trial of uh, Christ. Well, this is, uh, if you go to Matthew 24, 30, uh, the disciples ask, you know, what the coming, the sign of his coming would be. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man of, in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then in Matthew 26, 64, this is the trial of Jesus. You know, the uh, Pharisees, the Jews were asking him questions, trying to get him to confess to blasphemy and everything. And here it is, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds and coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark 13, 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then in Mark 14, 62. Uh, this isn't the trial of Jesus. Because they asked, uh, the Jews asked Jesus if he was the son of the blessed. Matter of fact, we sh I should just go ahead and read uh, what this says. All right. All right, Mark 14, 61. But he, Jesus, held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest ran his clothes and saith, what need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So, here it is. Jesus is telling them, Yep, you're going to see me coming in the clouds with power and glory. All right. Turn to First Thessalonians chapter 4 and let's see what um, all right let's go to verse 13 but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep we're talking about people that are dying not you know, they're sleeping and you got to shake them and wake them up. No. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the dead in Christ... Uh, the dead in Jesus, God's going to bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. 
For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, though, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. All right, turn to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And by the word, the word revelation means to reveal. So this is the revealing of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angels unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So if you're blessed by reading and hearing and keeping the words of the prophecy, uh, isn't the opposite that those that don't read and hear the words and keep them, aren't they cursed? I mean, isn't that the opposite of being blessed? So, I just can't understand why people are lazy and, and don't bother to read the Bible. I don't know. All right, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood washed us from our sins in his own blood think about the Passover and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with the clouds behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. And for those of you that don't know it, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last so basically Jesus is saying I'm A to Z and uh, matter of fact that's where we get the word alphabet because it was alpha beta in the Greek A and B so they change it from alpha beta to alphabet so all right, I think um, I've pretty much covered everything. Yeah, I think that's pretty much covers everything. So I think I ought to just close out. What do they say? Quit while you're ahead? You know, uh, it's already an hour and 15 minutes. So, all right, well. Now you got an idea of Christ coming in the clouds with glory. And the clouds, 
the clouds are going to be his witnesses. You know, didn't we cover that? So Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame that is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, Christ will one day come in the clouds with glory, and we are going to be part of that great cloud of witnesses. That will, that will be a day I'm sure we'll all remember. All right, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, who washed us from our sins by his own blood. In Jesus' precious name.